All right, welcome back, everybody. This is History of the Americas. We are currently discussing the colonial period throughout the region. And primarily, you might remember from our last video lecture, we were talking about Spanish exploration and conquest throughout the Americas. And we also discussed at length the Colombian exchange. And today, we're going to be picking up right where we kind of left off with that discussion. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you of your essential questions for this unit. One being, how did European colonization affect the indigenous populations of the Americas? And two, how did colonial institutions form and what led to resistance against these de facto governments? So kind of picking up the story where we left off from the Colombian exchange, let's talk a little bit more about Spanish motivations for exploration and conquest. And that specifically has to do with the, this term, the Reconquista, which is roughly translated to mean Reconquest. So the Reconquista was a period of roughly 750 years in which several Christian kingdoms slowly expanded themselves over the Iberian Peninsula and what we know today to be Spain and Portugal. And this all kind of occurred um, at the expense of the Muslim Moorish states. Um, basically, the Muslims invaded Iberia in 722 of the Common Era, and uh, the last Muslim stronghold that was Granada actually fell in 1492, ironically, when Christopher Columbus, you know, sailed the ocean blue. Um, but what basically happened was these Christian rulers represented the many campaigns of the Reconquistas retaking Christian territories previously lost to these Muslim invaders. So it had been argued that after 750 years of fighting against what they considered the infidel, the Spanish were basically psychologically committed to conquest, uh, but they needed more territory, QED. They needed to go explore the world to what they had this idea of this new world, uh, but they needed to go explore elsewhere throughout the world to identify these new territories. So what were these notable Spanish conquests in the new world? Uh, you have two specifically that we're going to talk about. Um, for kind of case studies, you have the Peruvian conquest in 1572, where you have roughly 180 Spanish soldiers um, invading modern day Peru. Um, this conquest of the Inca Empire led to spin off campaigns into present day Chile and Colombia. Then you also have the Mexican conquest in 1520. In 1519, Cortes and roughly 600 Spanish soldiers invaded the Aztec Empire and marched toward Tenochtitlan, uh, which is the present-day Mexico City. Um, and the Aztecs mistook Cortes and uh, as a god and allowed the Spaniards to kind of gain a foothold within the Aztec Empire. So upon his arrival at Tenochtitlan, he was kind of seen as this kind of deity in terms of um, his character and who um, they thought he was. But by December 1520, Cortes had full possession of the city, ultimately leading to other nearby conquests as well. So by the time that the um, Aztecs found out that Cortes was not necessarily who they thought he was, it, it had already basically become too late with the foothold that him and his um, colleagues had um, already established within Tenochtitlan. A couple other conquests and settlements for you guys to kind of keep in the back of your mind is in 1513, Ponce de Leon um, conquest uh, Florida. In 1528, you see Texas and northern Mexico uh, start to have settlements pop up. Fernando de Soto, roughly around the Mississippi River, and Francisco Coronado in 1540, roughly a lot of Southwest modern day United States, primarily all searching for gold. Um, but it's important for us to note that from these and other explorers, the Spanish settled in North America. Some enslaved the native population, um, primarily more so than 
not, uh, but the native population was ultimately decimated um, in many of these cases, while no massive amounts of gold was ever really discovered. In comes another term that you guys should be made aware of, that is the Treaty of Tordesillas. So I want you guys to kind of, just for the next couple slides, keep this little lesson question in mind. It says, what was the Treaty of Tordesillas and what role, if any, did it have in the Great Divide? So the Treaty of Tordesillas is this, as you can kind of see with the legend here on the map, um, is the line, the solid purple line that's kind of cutting through um, South America and also going up towards the Northern Hemisphere of the world. Uh, to kind of give you an introduction into what the Treaty of Tordesillas is, I have a brief video that I want you to watch. It's gonna, just gonna go ahead and play in this video, so no need to go to YouTube or anything like that. Just sit back, relax, and think about that focus question of how this Treaty of Tordesillas could kind of play into the idea of the Great Divide. The Treaty of Tordesillas is very important to understanding the age of explorations. It deals primarily with two European countries, the two countries that kind of started off the age of exploration. Spain and Portugal. Well, Portugal kind of got into the game first, thank you to Prince Henry the Navigator, and they'd already well established themselves around the Eastern Hemisphere. If we look at this map here, we can see all of the outpost sites that the Portuguese had claimed around the African continent, around India, through the islands of Indonesia, and then around to our major trade ports in China. The Portuguese had already claimed many of the available outposts for trade. The Portuguese were winning in the age of exploration. Of course the Spanish were looking for a different way to get to China. They were looking for a way to get to China without going through these Portuguese posts and hopefully faster. And that's why King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella hired a guy by the name of Christopher Columbus to try a whole new way to get there. He was going to sail west. What they didn't realize is that what he would discover would change the game. Because instead of finding the Eastern Hemisphere, and instead of finding East Asia, he found a whole new set of continents full with raw materials, gold and silver, and lots of things to gain wealth under this concept of mercantilism and capitalism. This brand new continent was what everybody wanted to claim. But who should get it? Well, back then, there wasn't a Supreme Court for international disputes. If two countries had a problem with each other, they typically went to the church for help. Remember, this is the late 1400s. There is no such thing as the Reformation yet. The Pope is still the Pope, and the Catholic Church still has a lot of power over its Catholic kings and queens. So they send it to the Pope to decide. Now. You also have to remember, this is right at the age of the Reconquista for Spain. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella have just successfully removed all non-Christians from the Iberian Peninsula. The, the Spanish will think that they are due the present of the New World in exchange for their holy, their holy wars and their holy efforts. And the Pope will agree. So the original papal decision will draw a line through the Atlantic Ocean claiming that everything west will go to Spanish control, and anything to the east is left to Portuguese control, since the Portuguese pretty much have already claimed everything on that side anyway. Well, the Portuguese don't like this because it completely cuts them out of the opportunity. They also will claim that because of the way the trade winds work in the ocean, that it's impossible for them to not cross that line to make it around the African coast. So they meet in the city of Tordesilla in the Iberian Peninsula, and they come up with a new agreement. They move the line of demarcation farther west, and anything west of this line is open for Spanish control, colonization, and exploration. The Portuguese cannot cross that line. But it does leave this eastern region, which will become Brazil, for the Portuguese. The Portuguese will can maintain control of their empire around Africa and India and East Asia, although there will be some outside islands that the Spanish will be able to control. And that is the Treaty of Tordesillas. All right, so a couple of questions for us to consider, and I want you guys to take a, a second to reflect and debrief and maybe write some answers to these questions in your notes. 
is one, what do you think the two lines of demarcation separate? Two, how were they decided upon? And three, why do you think that the line on the right was established after the two lines to the left? So go ahead and take a minute or two to kind of reflect on some of these questions, reflect on that video, and then go ahead and keep this video rolling. So, talking specifically about both the Spanish and Portuguese, um, I want to talk about the colonial government specifically. What did government look like in these colonial states? So, for the Spanish, uh, the church and the state were, were closely tied. You have the Spanish kings had divine rights still, as we kind of mentioned in the video. Uh, the Spanish power flowed from the king down. The king being in Spain and then you have other people that are kind of acting as ranking officers or agents of the kings that are called visceral royalties and due to the vastness of this empire it was divided into kingdom and provinces that had many different other uh, governors that were selected not elected um, and the local power reigned as the supreme uh, law in this region. In comparison to the Portuguese, they had what was called the captaincy system. And specifically, if we look to Brazil, it it's resembles a level of royal agents in the colony. So kind of similar to what we have um, in terms of maybe like a viceroyal, or, I mean a viscery, um, but in some areas they had the same functionary of that viceroyalty, but in theory they were sub Coordinate to the viceroys. They referred. They were also referred to as the donatario. Uh, territorial division and royal land grants were quite common, and they had specific responsibilities. One to gathering settlers and kind of populating this uh, settlement, to caring for their spiritual welfare, and to protect them from attacks and to promote agriculture and commerce. Colonial economies in many of these regions initially focused on trade, trying to find the Indies and, and trying to find spice and money and resources, but started to shift to be used for extraction in terms of gold and silver, sugar and other cash crops such as dyes. Uh, but we should note that there was little industrial development occurring within these economies. And that leads us to another term that you guys should be familiar with, that is mercantilism. Mercantilism is defined as belief in the benefits of profitable trading, basically commercialism. You start to see that there's this kind of system for trading and that people believe that the idea of trade is beneficial. Uh, so you start to see that mercantilism starts to become more prevalent throughout the area. Uh, and you also have, as you can kind of see, some of um, these effects that follow. In theory, no Spaniard could sail anywhere without approval, but in reality, Corruption and smuggling were, were quite common throughout the region. They maintained uh, Spain's trade monopoly, but served as a commercial court and was the clearinghouse for all traffic within the colonies. And power declined in the 1700s and, abol and was ultimately abolished in 1790 after Spain was forced to open up their trading policies talk a bit about labor in the colonies. So labor specifically was often thought to be an act beneath a conquistador. So it was not something that a conquistador would actually take part in. Um, what farming areas they did have were often called encomiendas or entrustments run by encomenderos. And we kind of talked about this with the crash course video um, last week. Uh, but the, in the native society, it was di different labor systems. The encomendero had the obligation to protect, Christianize, and civilize the Indians. And in return, he could collect and keep the tax that the village had 
customarily paid to the crown. So when the Indian could not pay the tax, which was more often than not, the encomendero then obliged the native into, uh, obligated the native into personal labor. So what we start to see is that this lack of ability to pay this tax that was uh, forced upon them by the encomendero basically forced them into um, forced labor. Uh, encomen encomiendas often varied in size. Uh, for example, Cortez was named Marquez de Val um, and had 22 towns. Uh, system basically would cause disputes and problems between the crowns and creoles for the duration of colonial Latin America. And these results of the encomienda system include the sanctioning of labor um, that often resulted in abuse of those that were being forced into indentured servitude. So if we're looking kind of at this graphic, the encomienda, the plan versus the reality, was this idea that the Spanish claimed that the encomienda system would benefit both settlers and Indians, but it did not necessarily work out that way. The plan was that Spanish settlers would protect and care for and Christianize the, the native population populations and the natives would work a portion of their time for Spanish settlers. But what we ended up actually getting was that Spanish settlers forced long labor, didn't really pay their native workers, uh, they failed to protect them and they often seized their lands um, and kind of recoup what they lost. And we also see that natives uh, died from disease and harsh living and working conditions. So the encomienda roughly ends after clergy protests and native revolt, but abuses continue under what would later be called the repartimiento. So let's talk about that for a second. So the repartimiento system replaced the encomienda system in which um, work earns 10% of the crop. So whatever work you put in, you were given 10% of what you were able to basically grow. So this kind of levied or forced a work allotment. Um, it required each village to provide a weekly quota of, in, of natives for work on projects that involved public goods, such as government buildings, churches, roads, irrigation, etc. And workers were paid an eighth of a peso. Uh, so what this repartimiento system often led to was widespread abuses, just like the um, just like the encomienda system, and um, it ultimately lasted for most of the colonial era. Let's talk a bit about society and class dynamics within the colony. So the limpieza de sangre uh, basically is translated into the cleanliness of blood. So you have uh, peninsulares who are basically Spaniards born in Spain could hold high positions of church or state. So in, you, in the social dynamic structure, you have pen peninsulares or, that were kind of at the top. And then you had Creoles, um, which were Spaniards that were born in Latin America. They're often seen as second class citizens and could not hold high position. And then you often had what um, they referred to as mixed blood, uh, being um, white or mestizos that were kind of a combination of natives and Spanish. You had mestizos, had a special status um, called like the people of reason. Uh, natives and blacks were not necessarily kind of lumped into this category. Um, they had a status of lower kind of middle class. So they weren't at the bottom, but they necessarily weren't emerging into that middle class of society yet. Um, a few started, had held minor government positions, um, but most held positions for like plantations, mines, and mansions. Uh, some were artisans and shopkeepers or small small business owners, uh, but the commonality was uh, in being a farmer or some sort of cowboy. So, um, what we're seeing here is a breakdown of the kind of class dynamics throughout the colonies. Um, and then you also have um, non-whites who are often 
referred to as Zombos, which was a mix of both uh, native and black laborers. Um, and then you also have um, Africans that were primarily f- forced into migration, um, in which you saw some free and some slave labor, what did not necessarily uh, specifically embody what we know today as the institution of slavery in the United States, but slaves were often allowed to work for or pay in their free time, and they were allowed to marry um, who they wanted on their own accord, according to Spanish law. Then you had natives, um, which was the largest aspect of the population that largely served as peasants. So let's talk about the Incas in Peru. So uh, they were largely separated from their communities. They were devoid of ties to ancestral communities and kin groups or family groups. Um, The labor group included Native Americans who attached themselves to Spaniards, often working for them in exchange to access a small plot of land. And under the viceroyalty of Toledo um, y Figueroa, groups emerged. One group of Yanaconas were working for Spaniards, basically exempted them from the Mita, um, and others were subject to relocation or reductions in taxation and Mita service. Um, But Yanacona status on a Spaniard hacienda was a major advantage for Americans. conduct a brief overview of the religion of the colonies. Uh, The Christian era began in the New World roughly within 1492. The Spanish introduced a different moral code to the native societies. The arrival of the church terminated human sacrifice and cannibalism, but it also kind of represents this idea of assimilation or forced assimilation into um, the kind of Spanish culture um, and Christian concepts suffused areas of native culture as a main focus um, being that to force the natives towards religious and societal assimilation. According to the Spaniards, Catholicism was to be the only accepted religion in the colonies and the Catholic Church in Latin America was not merely an adjunct to the conquest or a side issue in the later independence movement, but rather that the history of the conquest and the history of the church itself are completely intertwined. So the Inquisition in Spain became a reign of terror in the New World. Temples were raised and idols were destroyed um, and cultures of the native population were viewed as a manifestation of the devil. The functions of the church primarily was to serve as a tool or royal government for Um, the larger Spanish government in Europe. The church took over many functions that largely belonged to the state in the modern world, such as education, banking, hospitals, and public charity, um, and also started to clamp down on their own control of customs um, and um, other societal aspects uh, of day-to-day operations. So it's kind of similar to the Inquisition in the sense that conversion of the natives was seen as the way to control them. Missions created a machine for the propagation of the faith and the school. Intellectual movements were quashed to kind of limit the amount of resistance efforts to this kind of forced assimilation. The church saw expression of Aboriginal culture as the work of the devil. And you'll see this idea of iconoclasm throughout the region. Effects of the church in Spanish colonies, the long term, the short term, is with the introduction of Catholicism within the Spanish colonies, it often led to forced religious assimilation on the native populations. It replaced various aspects of native culture with civilized or European cultural aspects. The church became the largest landowner in Latin America. So with that, that kind of concludes our presentation here to with our focus primarily on Spain. When we pick up the next segment of this video lecture, we will be talking about primarily the co- British colonies in North America and ultimately we'll be heading north towards Canada.
at some point. So with that, I would urge you to take what you have know what you've gained from this lecture, reflect on it, try to provide some sort of a summary or some sort of a conclusion to uh, whatever you can in terms of your essential questions that were posed at the beginning of this video and do a little bit of reflection time so that when you come into class um, and we're going to be talking about some of these um, societal aspects that were discussed throughout the lecture and diving a little bit deeper into them, you have a better understanding of them yourself. So with that, thank you. Like, comment, subscribe, ring that bell, and we will see you guys next time.